Okay, thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to, uh, to be able to speak here. I'm very happy to see so many people and uh, the interest in France really uh, expanding and increasing. So I think it's a, it's a really promising and interesting development and a, a nice journey, as uh, the organizers called it. Uh, so what I would like to do is take you on a journey of uh, the current status of treatment in ADHD, uh, and especially with a focus and zooming in on uh, the treatment of ADHD with neurofeedback. I think it's good maybe to start with the first uh, study, which is the NIMH-MTA study. And this, I think, is a very interesting milestone study that everyone uh, doing something with ADHD uh, should be aware of. Now, I think we've seen in one of the previous talks that there's indeed many treatments out there for the treatment of ADHD, including uh, methylphenidate treatment, which is the most often resorted to treatment, but also multi-component behavior therapy and other treatments. And I think the interesting thing of this study is that this was an NIMH-sponsored study, so it was not sponsored by the industry, but uh, it was really an independent study. And what they tried to do is they randomized about close to 600 children to four different treatments to investigate what are the real-life of real life effects of these treatments, but also what are the long-term uh, outcomes of these treatments. So basically they assigned the, the, the children with ADHD to 14 months of systematic medication management, so that's mainly uh, prescription with uh, Ritalin or methylphenidate, uh, or a multi-component behavior therapy, more like a psycho psychological approach, or the combination, or basically doing nothing, which they called usually usual community care. And I think the interesting thing, I'm not sure if this one works, the interesting thing is if you look at the time, here we see uh, time uh, in months, uh, and here we see, for example, inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity. So the interesting thing what this study shown is that both groups that included uh, medication have shown the largest improvements on uh, symptom domains. And so far, nothing new, because we know those treatments, especially medication, uh, do work in the short term. However, when they followed up the groups across time, here we see the uh, usual community care and here the, the multi-component uh, behavior therapy, and we see as time progresses that the differences between the groups based on the initial randomization disappear. So this basically means that, uh, as the authors concluded, that after 24 months, which basically is the two-year time period, there's no difference anymore uh, on symptom uh, improvements between all the groups, really suggesting to, the, to us that, yes, uh, the treatments do have an effect in the short term, but these effects somehow disappear when time progresses. Well, how that exactly comes, we don't know, but I think this is one interesting study potentially suggesting what's causing this. And here they image the dopamine transporter, uh, which is basically responsible for breaking down the dopamine in the brain. Uh, and what they've done is they've basically measured healthy children uh, with a time period in between of 12 months. And here they've also measured uh, children with ADHD uh, who were uh, uh, prescribed with methylphenidate. And what they found was that after 12 months of systematic treatment with medication, uh, there's an upregulation of the dopamine transporter, as uh, suggesting to us that possibly you need higher doses in order to get the same effect. And so possibly this might be one of the explanations that the body adapts itself to, uh, the brain adapts to the systematic treatment with methylphenidate and therefore um, yeah, might lower the, uh, the clinical efficacy uh, of methylphenidate across time. So I think this, this doesn't mean that we should not treat. I think we should treat, and that's what I will show you with the French situation in the next slide. Uh, but I think we should still treat. But I think what this is really pointing to is that, yes, there is a real big need and requirement for treatments that have sustained effects across time. And we need to have treatments where children have a benefit from even beyond the, the period of two years. So I think if you look at the French situation, I think it's quite interesting. I don't know the exact details, but I was told more or less that at least until last year that ADHD was more or less regarded as a psycho from a psychoanalytical point of view, and also that psychoanalysis is rather big in France. Uh, according to some media outlets, ADHD does not exist in France. Uh, at least that's what, uh, what I came across in the, on the internet. Uh, however, I think uh, it's not realistic to think that ADHD do does not exist. As a matter of fact, if you look at this study, which was published several years ago by Fayad, uh, what these uh, investigators did, they, they used uh, a group of, uh, of clinicians who were all trained in the same way. And basically what they've done, they have been uh, calling up many people in, in various countries, including uh, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, Spain, and also France. And this is basically an independent study where they interviewed people over the phone. If they were deemed to have prob probable ADHD, they were invited. And the international standards were applied to this group. And basically the only outlier they discovered worldwide was France. 
So in adults with ADHD, we see that the independently verified prevalence rate is 7.4%, which is the highest of all the studies they found. So I think what, what, what this might suggest is that maybe by under-treating ADHD, by not recognizing it uh, in, in childhood, you are basically creating a bigger problem, and that, that might, uh, might be explained to be uh, resulting in the highest prevalence rates, but if objectively identified uh, in France in this uh, case. So I think in that sense, I think it's nice that we have the symposium. It's nice that we really start looking into the future of, of uh, modern treatments and see if we can really prevent this problem in, uh, in the future. So I think we've seen and we know a lot about drug treatments uh, and we've seen that already. But I think another interesting notion is these are publication rates uh, of uh, pharmacological treatment for depression and pharmacological treatment for ADHD. And many people often think that the pharmaceutical industry is still doing a lot. But I think uh, what, has, what is not that much known is that since 2010, the whole pharmaceutical industry has suspended its research and development budgets in CNS. CNS standing for brain uh, diseases or psych psychiatry. So that means that they're no longer investing in the development of antidepressants or anxiolytics or uh, drug treatments for ADHD simply because the investments are way too high uh, and do not live up, uh, the, 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 the income they generate with it does not live up to the investment they will have to do. And I think that's already witnessed here in the publication rates, rates which are going down for pharmacological approaches in depression and are stagnating for pharmacological approaches approaches in ADHD. On the other hand, if you look at neuromodulation, neuromodulation being a very broad kind of uh, approach uh, which incorporates neurofeedback but also RTMS, I think we can really witness the reverse. We see a, a huge increase in publication rates on neurofeedback uh, but also on RTMS. And of course, this in incorporates many applications, including fMRI neurofeedback, EEG neurofeedback, etc. And so I think we're really witnessing, as far as I can see, a, a paradigm change in psychiatry, uh, where in, indeed ph pharmac pharmacological interventions will remain a mainstay for many indications. But we do see that neuromodulation is picking up and is really uh, getting its place in, uh, in clinical practice, which I think is a very promising, uh, promising aspect. So what is neurofeedback? Uh, well, to maybe start off, I think it's good to maybe also show what is and what is not neurofeedback. If you Google on the, uh, on the internet, you will find many EEG applications uh, which measure the EEG and somehow feed it back. For example, this Nico Mimi uh, will have some ears and if you pay attention, the ears will move, uh, showing that you're paying attention. Uh, we have this emotive where you can keep a kind of uh, drone in, in the air by brain control, uh, the Mato Mindflex, but also the smart brain technologies, uh, which basically claims to be a, a neurofeedback uh, application. And I can name many more uh, that claim to be a neurofeedback application, but I think the only conclusion we can make is this is entertainment. This is not neurofeedback. There's no real learning process taking place. And this is simply like a game-like approach, more like a brain-computer interface or for entertainment purposes. But these things do not intend to change the brain. These do not intend to, to, uh, to teach something. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So also when you evaluate the literature, evaluate claims being made by manufacturers, by equipment manufacturers, etc., keep this in mind. I mean, this is not neurofeedback. This is a nice toy, a nice gimmick, but not what we should be looking at. So what is neurofeedback? Well, neurofeedback is a very boring process. You're looking at a, at a screen and this is what it looks like. You have some bar graphs that are going up and down. You get an auditory feedback, a ding. And this is the slow cortical potential approach where you need to make the fish swim above or swim below. Uh, and it needs to be very simple. I mean, we're feeding back a very complex signal. Uh, so you need to have very uh, simple feedback. The more sophisticated your feedback becomes, the less the person will learn. And I think the only way to conceptualize this, if you want to have a movie on this as well, uh, but always think about this. These are the pigeons from Skinner. Skinner was the one who basically first described operant conditioning uh, of, uh, of behavior. And I think basically uh, we are also relying on the principles of oper operant conditioning when we apply neurofeedback. And I always tell people, if you're setting up your neurofeedback, think about these pigeons. If the pigeons cannot make sense of it, your patient cannot make sense of it either. So I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind. It's, you're not about entertaining the child. You're not there to, to have the child play sophisticated games or listen to some music which distorts or does not distort. It's really about applying feedback and make the brain learn something. If the brain doesn't learn, you will not get any clinical benefit. 
So what do we know about the efficacy of, uh, of neurofeedback? Well, there's various studies uh, being published. This is one we published in 2009, which, which was a meta-analysis on the different uh, symptom domains uh, in ADHD, like inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. And the white bars are basically the within subject effect size, so that's the, the real life benefit a patient will get. And the gray bars are basically the between group effect size, so this is including more or less the non-specific effects of neurofeedback, uh, which are a little bit diminished. But if you still look at the effect sizes, I think they're quite comparable. They're large. They're to 0.8 to 1 for inattention, uh, which means about a one standard deviation improvement uh, on symptoms. They're also large for impulsivity, and we see some smaller effect sizes for hyperactivity. And if we compare that to the effect sizes you gain with Ritalin, I think we can at least claim that, especially for the domain of inattention and impulsivity, the effects are quite similar. Whereas for the domain of hyperactivity, the effects tend to be somewhat smaller than, uh, than for methylphenidate. But I'll show you in a couple of slides why we can understand that maybe better. Of course, we've done this in 2009, and since that time, several other studies have been published. Uh, and this was a more recent meta-analysis by the European ADHD Guidelines Group from Sonega Bark, where they try to use a kind of different approach to doing a meta-analysis uh, in trying to control more or less for what they call placebo or non-specific effects. So they applied two types of meta-analysis. The first one was based on parent rating, and so they used the parent rating as the most distal kind of metric closest to the child. On the other hand, they do, did a second meta-analysis which only relied on teacher ratings because they hypothesized at least that the teacher is more blind to the intervention. The teacher is not that susceptible to placebo effects. I think whether that's an accurate um, um, uh, assumption, I doubt, because I think uh, we also know that parents are much more sensitive in rating the severity as opposed to teachers who can change every year, etc. So there's some difficulties in the interpretation. So here we see that they reported an effect size quite similar to what we reported of 0.6 which was a significant effect size based on, on parent rating. However, for the teacher rating, it was close to significant, but just not significant. You have to keep in mind, we looked quite critically at this meta-analysis, and we noted that there were some discrepancies, which we also published in the same journal, uh, where they had, did some invalid comparisons. Based on the, the criteria they set up themselves, uh, they made a wrong comparison from one of the studies, and, uh, for example, they compared, uh, for one study, neurofeedback against uh, the waiting list control group, whereas they should have compared it uh, to the co cognitive training group. Because we know that, for example, in the neurofeedback group, the medication decreased by 30%. Well, then I think we're comparing apples to oranges. So that's an invalid comparison. And there were some other things. So if we redid this meta-analysis, we did find that both for parent as well as teacher ratings, there were significant uh, differences and also significant effect sizes. And so in a sense, I think with this small correction, uh, which is also published, I think we can also deem this uh, to be a positive meta-analysis for neurofeedback. Then I was happy to see some work from France as well, from Jean Arthur. Uh, so I was uh, happy to, f to see this uh, other meta-analysis where he used a similar approach to the ADHD guidelines group, but he also looked independently to hyperactivity uh, complaints and inattention complaints and found uh, for, for inattention the strongest effects uh, in the meta-analysis, which I think makes sense if we look at this earlier meta-analysis. We do know that the strongest effects for neurofeedback are really achieved on the domain of inattention. So then the, the next question would be, I think we can now get a kind of sense like, yes, from meta-analytical approaches, all with their strengths and weaknesses, uh, we can appreciate that, yes, there's really signal. Uh, there's something uh, that neurofeedback can do in the treatment of ADHD. But we know that for a medication, the effects uh, do not outlast a period of two years in time. So what are the long-term effects of neurofeedback? Well, we do not have the same amount of data for neurofeedback that is available for medication. But I think the data we have is quite compelling and quite promising. This is a mini meta-analysis we've done. We are now updating this. And here we looked at uh, the effect size from pretreatment to post-treatment, from pretreatment to six months, and pretreatment to two years follow-up, which was uh, two studies that actually did follow up after two years. The interesting thing is that with these two-year follow-up studies, which was based on slow cortical potential neurofeedback, that not only were some of the effects maintained, but also the ability to regulate brain activity was still there. And so the, these children could still modulate their brain activity above chance level in the expected direction. And so the learning maintained. 
I think one thing we can at least, we cannot draw too many conclusions from these data, but at least these data suggest that it's not true that the effects from pre to post treatment disappear with time. If anything, there tends to be a slight increase in the effect sizes, especially for the domain of hyperactivity. So we're currently updating this because many more randomized controlled studies have been published and this is work in preparation. Uh, we hope to submit this quite soon. It's a, quite a dense uh, a graphic, but here we see the effects for inattention, here for hyperactivity impulsivity, and here we see many studies with the grand mean effect size for neurofeedback for the control group, uh, <clears throat> and here we see the same effects uh, at follow-up. And what we see is that the control groups uh, or have non-significant effect sizes, whereas these effect sizes are significant, and there's a tendency for the effects to increase across time, whereas especially for inattention, uh, there's a small decrease in the effect size across time. As I think this further tends to suggest, and I think this is a summary slide, where we see uh, the grand mean effect size uh, for inattention and hyperactivity uh, from outtake to follow up and we see it's slightly increasing. Uh, it's a significant, these are 95% confidence intervals and so it's a highly significant effect we're looking at as well. So I think this is really showing and, and further demonstrating uh, that yes, there tends to be a tendency that the effects uh, maintain across time. So how should we interpret neurofeedback studies? And I think this is a really crucial message. Uh, unfortunately, um, I, th I think the EEG neurofeedback field can learn a lot from the fMRI neurofeedback field. This is one slide where they are very careful stating like, well, this study has, has modulated activity in, in the sensory motor cortex. This study has modulated activity in the motor cortex. And this study has modulated activity in the SMA. So in this overview, they are very careful stating like, well, if we train this specific area, we expect different effects than if we're training this other area. However, what we see in all the meta-analysis performed thus far, uh, basically they're, they're calling neurofeedback is neurofeedback. Meaning that if, if people training posterior alpha or training something different in the frontal cortex, they all label it as the same. From an experimental perspective, it's very interesting to try different protocols, but you should not merge them and not, not rule that if one study is negative, that used a completely different approach, that therefore neurofeedback is ineffective. And what you will see happening in the literature over and over again is that people, and I call it uh, comparing apples to oranges, and they're really comparing apples to oranges, and all EEG neurofeedback is deemed to be the same, which I think is completely not true. And we know that, and we've published this in this uh, paper, which we call The Long and Winding Road, which I think is a catchy title for the history of neurofeedback. And we know these are all highly controlled studies, double-blind, placebo-controlled studies. This one from 1973 <clears throat> uh, used an interesting approach of alpha enhancement neurofeedback in ADHD, and it did not find an effect. Well, I think we can appreciate, for those of you who know something about EEG, that alpha enhancement in the back of the head is completely different from theta, beta neurofeedback or SMR neurofeedback. So albeit it's an interesting approach, it doesn't mean anything. It's interesting to know that there's specificity for neurofeedback. Some protocols do work, some protocols do not work. Similar, we now also know that the training of this NASA patented engagement index, and that's a smart brain technology uh, slide I showed you before, and where they're interfacing with the PlayStation, which I think is very hard for people to learn and extract meaningful information from that. And here they're training theta, alpha, SMR, beta, which I think is a too complex protocol. And you cannot l exercise control over four frequency bands at once. And both these double pl placebo controlled studies uh, were negative. So I think, again, nice to know that there's some approaches that do not work. Then there's also the Landsbergen and Van Dongen Boomsma study, uh, who also used a kind of QEG-based approach for neurofeedback. Uh, and for example, they have been training in many subjects SMR at F3 and F4. So SMR, what does it stand for? SMR is sensory motor rhythm. And so that, uh, that implies that the sensory motor rhythm is present across the, uh, uh, the sensory motor strip. But I think we all know that the sensory motor strip is under C3 and C4 and not under F3, F4. And so again, an interesting approach. Um, it's not localized in the right direction, uh, but again, shown not to work. 
So summarizing at least the, uh, the results, uh, so, so summarizing this, I think it's important that we more carefully look at the implementation of neurofeedback, yeah, that we spot studies that are comparing apples to oranges and not all neurofeedback is neurofeedback. I think we can conclude from reviewing the whole literature of neurofeedback, I think currently there's three approaches that have really demonstrated efficacy uh, in the treatment of ADHD. Uh, I think the most well investigated is slow cortical potential neurofeedback at CZ. <clears throat> There's very soon a new study coming out of Germany, uh, which is a multi-center study from Ute Strehl and Martin Holtmann, uh, which has also demonstrated positive effects. Uh, so adding that further to the whole evidence base of uh, slow cortical potential neurofeedback. SMR neurofeedback at central locations, C3, C0, or C4, so not at frontal locations is effective. And also theta beta neurofeedback at frontal central locations. And finally, I think it's really important to also appreciate the role of learning theory. We have to uh, see if the, the implementation of neurofeedback is intended as an entertainment and more game-like interventions are really like based on operant uh, conditioning principles and that's what we can really call neurofeedback. <coughs> So I think the evidence summary, uh, if you then apply uh, what often people would like to see is the APA guidelines, uh, which are widely accepted guidelines, and this is a publication that will be coming out quite soon. And then I think based on these lines of evidence, we can really uh, appreciate that we're meeting level five, which means efficacious and specific. And we published this together with uh, Hartmut Heinrich and Ute Strehl, who are very experienced in this field as well. And we all agree that based on had two independent multi-center studies have shown effect, two independent RCTs have compared neurofeedback with medication, and three meta-analyses have also demonstrated efficacy. So I think it's really uh, important uh, that we uh, evaluate it in that way. So where is the main discussion coming from? Why do most psychiatrists, most critical psychiatrists, not accept neurofeedback? Well, the only uh, uh, issue is with how do you evaluate it? I think it's a psychological, psychiatric technique that should be evaluated according to APA standards. But the critics will always say, no, you need to evaluate it as if it is a drug. And evaluating a drug requires a double-blind, placebo-controlled study. And I think it's very uh, difficult to really do a, a solid double-blind, placebo-controlled study. It's the same as telling a child, like, I'm going to learn you something, but I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to learn. I mean, that's what a double-blind placebo-control study uh, implicates. So there's a lot of um, uh, problems with implementing a double-blind control uh, very validly for neurofeedback. So that's also important to keep in mind. So finally, I do not, not have time to go in a lot of detail, uh, but also to demonstrate to you that there's more work going on, that we also understand how neurofeedback actually works. Uh, and this is a model we published several years ago, where we're positioning that ADHD, to a substantial degree, is a vigilance dysregulation disorder. And that vigilance regulation, the maintenance and regulation of arousal, is one of the core components of ADHD. And we're also positing that sleep, uh, where many people will say that sleep is a comorbidity uh, and we think that sleep is maybe the core issue in ADHD. If you treat sleep, the ADHD goes away. We've now demonstrated in several studies it indeed works like that uh, and we also know that if you apply a specific form of neurofeedback, SMR neurofeedback, you're training this reticular thalamocortical uh, cortical network which is very well described and this is the network involved in generating sleep spindles. And when you train this rhythm during the day, and you measure your sleep EEG, you will see that there's an increased sleep spindle density. So you can measure a kind of biomarker, if you will, not during the waking EEG, but only during the sleeping EEG. So what do these sleep spindles mean? Well, in general, the more sleep spindles you have, the quicker you will fall asleep. The quicker you will fall asleep, that means children get more sleep, and after some time, their inattention improves. And that's exactly what we demonstrated in this study, where we compared SMR neurofeedback with theta-beta neurofeedback, when you look at all the clinical outcomes, they're not different. So clinically speaking, both of the treatments have the same uh, large effects uh, in the treatment of ADHD. However, if we do a mediator-moderator analysis, we see which is the route where, where it establishes its effects. Then we see that this is pre-treatment, halfway, and post-treatment. And only for SMR neurofeedback, we found that first we see sleep onset latency improving, uh, further suggestive of increased sleep spindles. And this was required 
for the inattention improvements to occur at post-treatment, whereas we do not find such a relationship for theta-beta neurofeedback. So even though both treatments on the clinical level have the same uh, efficacy, we do see that the working mechanism is completely different. I cannot tell you what the working mechanism is for theta-beta neurofeedback, but for SMR neurofeedback we, we know it normalizes sleep, and only when sleep is normalized, that's a requirement, only then your inattention will catch up uh, and, you, and will be normalized as well. There's another funny story, uh, we also, based on this theory uh, we published a long time ago, uh, we could also predict that uh, we know the circadian system is also involved in this whole network. So a really strange prediction we made at that time is, well, if the model is true, uh, then there should be an association between sunlight and ADHD. And to begin with, it sounds like, well, that's a really crazy idea. <clears throat> so that's why we thought, well, let's test it. And here you see uh, a slide which shows you the prevalence rate, and the darker the color, the higher the prevalence rate of ADHD in the United States. And the overlaying map here is showing you the sunlight intensity. And so the redder it is, the more sunlight we see. And I think we can all appreciate there's a perfect overlap between the amount of sunlight intensity and the prevalence rates of ADHD. We've now replicated this in four different samples. We also understand a little bit about the genetics behind it and the uh, interrelationship with the dopaminergic system. And this, I think, could be a very nice uh, way to maybe do prevention, simply exposing children to more sunlight during the day, opening up the roofs and schools, etc. But again, that's a whole different uh, presentation in itself. But just to show you that there's, uh, we understand much more about how ADHD works and how neurofeedback impacts on the system as well. Oh. So, as a final slide, uh, to summarize this, I think we can uh, summarize that uh, based on APA criteria, uh, neurofeedback uh, is efficacious and specific, at least for these protocols. It does not mean that neurofeedback is evidence-based for everything. Some protocols are not efficacious, alpha enhancement, engagement, uh, index, and bi bifrontal SMR neurofeedback. We have seen that neurofeedback does have long-term effects, and there's a tendency which we need to investigate further uh, for further improvements. So I think any future studies should more strongly focus on the long-term effects of neurofeedback. It could sometimes well be that your treatment does not show an effect from beginning to end of treatment, but maybe statistically it might show up at follow-up, which I think is even more powerful and uh, more important. When evaluating your feedback, focus on entertainment versus neurofeedback and also the protocol specificity. And I think uh, there's an important role for sleep in the etiology of ADHD uh, and the effects of SMR neurofeedback mediate clinical improvements in ADHD via sleep. And very importantly, uh, we've seen this in Holland, and I want to warn you in France for this as well, is that not all clinicians are practicing evidence-based. There's many people still practicing your feedback in ways uh, I would not recommend uh, trying that at home. In general, uh, people always ask me, like, well, how can I pick them out? Well, it's very difficult. Most often I tell them, the more people claim, if they claim that their, their protocols and their feedback works for everything, for depression, anxiety, ADHD, insomnia, <laughs> burnout, the longer the list, the less trust you should have. A second one, the more magic they claim, the less confidence you should have. Sometimes people claim, well, my software is so smart, I don't need to understand the brain. My software will do it all because I have such smart software, it's not investigated, but the software is so smart, it does it all. So the more magic people claim, the less confidence to have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, uh, this. Uh, uh, it's very nice to hear you. Um, Est-ce que uh, y a quelques questions dans la salle? On, on part pour 10 minutes uh, de questions. Uh, je pense qu'il y a des, des micros. Hello. Uh, thank you for a presentation. It was lovely. I'd like to ask a question, please. Uh, in your opinion, uh, do we hope one day we would get a same uh, result between uh, the DBS and the neurofeedback peer feedback? With DBS, you the mean? The deep brain stimulation. And what, how do you mean that? Uh, sorry? How, how do you mean that, the relation between DBS and neurofeedback? No, I mean, I, I mean for me, um, I think 
it should be, I mean, because neurofeedback, it's a brain stimulation as well, you see. It's, so when, it's not yeah. brain stimulation, but yeah. neuromodulation. Yeah. You're okay. modulating but brain you're activity. Gonna do yeah. that. I, mean, I mean, for me, the effect of the, the, the DPS, it's uh, by the treatment, I mean, it's, it's a longer treatment. It's very difficult, not so easy, you know. So I'd like to understand if we think one day we can, we can uh, compare between the DBS yeah. and the neurofeedback, biofeedback. Yeah, well, well. I, I think developments like deep brain stimulation, but to some degree maybe also fMRI neurofeedback, will not be the mainstay for every patient in the future. And I think that's not the intention as well. I think what we have to keep in mind that DBS is a very interesting research uh, tool. If you think that a network is involved with depression, you stick a needle there, you stimulate it, and then you know causally that yes, it's involved. And I think the way I perceive it, I think DBS is there to stay for some while, for the severest of severest patients. But I think it's more also a tool to learn more about the brain. And if you learn more about the brain, for example, the DBS knowledge has already resulted in knowledge to optimize RTMS treatment uh, in, in depression. And I think the same fMRI neurofeedback, I hope, will become translational as well. And that if they find a specific signature they give feedback on, and you measure EEG at the same time, that we can extract the EEG signature and uh, translate that to EEG neurofeedback. And so I think that both of those uh, developments will drive uh, the neuromodulation field in, in much more detail. Uh, and therefore, we can, uh, based on that knowledge, improve neurofeedback and RTMS in the future. Thank you. Only a small question I'd like to know. No, une seule question, oh, par okay, contre, uh, par personne. <laughs> Merci. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, how did you measure the effect in the attention and in the impulsivity in your studies? Because in the meta-analysis, they use parent and teacher questionnaires. So how did you evaluate for, especially in, in the attention realm? Yeah, well, for the meta-analysis, uh, the 2009 meta-analysis, we used parent ratings uh, for attention and uh, hyperactivity, impulsivity, but f uh, for hyperactivity, but for impulsivity, we used neuropsychological uh, tests. And so we took the, uh, it's a commission errors on a, on a CPT. Uh, so that's really based, on, which is important one, I, I didn't stress that, but that's a neuropsychological correlate of impulsivity, which I think makes, makes it quite strong as well. So thanks for your talk. I'm, I'm here. Oh. <laughs> it's the light um, <laughs> shining. Uh, I'm quite naive about uh, neurofeedback, and I, I need some information about it. You say that you you teach a brain, so I need some information about the way you proceed. So, for instance, if you base your therapy uh, on concerning the ratio between beta and theta, do you mm -hmm. change the way the brain is functioning? And uh, can you evidence the change? And how long do you have to teach the brain? And when the brain is, is teach, does the effect maintain over time? You say that the, the results can, can be still evidenced after two years. That means that you modify the way the brain is working uh, during all this period. Can you tell, yeah. tell us something more about yeah. I, I, I think in general, I mean, simplistically, many people will say, well, theta is high, we downtrain it, so it goes down. Uh, I can assure you that doesn't happen. It's not that simple. Uh, there's only some exceptions to that rule. Uh, so I think the, the, the first comparison is that neurofeedback, you should conceptualize as learning to ride a bike. No, when you learn to ride a bike, no one told you that you need to tense this muscle, relax that muscle, tense that muscle, relax, etc. It was by doing it, by falling off your bike and sitting on it and doing it, you learned it. Neurofeedback is based on a similar kind of learning, uh, learning process. You should not ne never tell your patient, well, if you try this, it might go better. So research has shown that if people have a cognitive strategy, it will impair their learning. So the only right instruction to give a neurofeedback is just do it. And they need to find it out themselves. I always tell people, if we could tell you what to do, we don't need the EEG. Then we do psychotherapy. Um, so that's one thing. So it's really like an implicit learning task uh, you're trying to engage people in. Um, yeah, what exactly the working mechanism is. I mean, it would be simple to say, if you downtrain theta, you would expect it to go down ac across treatment. On a group level, you'll find it. So some studies have found that it will decrease across time. But if you would start looking at the individual level, it's not that reliable. Like what I've shown with SMR neurofeedback, I think that's the first form of neurofeedback, but also with SCP neurofeedback, where you can find a neuropsychological correlate. SMR neurofeedback, we train here. 
that's 12 to 15 hertz. If you measure the waking EEG, nothing will change. If you ask people to fall asleep and you measure their EEG, then you will say at these locations, the 12 to 40, 15 hertz popping up, that's the sleep spindles. And so I think we still need a lot of research uh, to demonstrate what it exactly does, uh, but it doesn't invalidate neurofeedback. I mean, for years uh, we were told that an SSRI works on serotonin and that depression is a serotonergic deficient syndrome. We know that's not true. And so there was also a proposed marketing claim. Uh, so I think we should maybe prevent that and say, well, let's do the research on that. In the meantime, based on clinical efficacy, we can see if it works by using appropriate control groups. And then the research can continue to really establish uh, the working mechanism behind it. For theta beta neurofeedback, we don't know exactly. Uh, but for SMR neurofeedback and SCP, we do a little bit know a little bit more about the uh, mechanism involved.